Well, hello and welcome to the Sabbath School Study Guide, study lesson study discussion, we'll call it that. And we're glad you're with us today. My name is Pastor Isaac. This is Israel. We're glad to be with you. And um, we're going to be on Lesson 7 today. So whenever you join us, perhaps it's Saturday morning, perhaps it's an evening or another day of the week. We're glad you have chosen to listen to our discussion and study with us. Um, again, as I said, it's uh, lesson number seven, and the title is Christ's Victory Over Death. And why that even means anything for us today, right? Because uh, the point was he died for us, and that's and that's the big thing, you know, but there's more to it. So we're going to get into that uh, discussion tonight. And we invite you to, to uh, join us for it and maybe even leave some comments down below. But before we start, uh, Israel, would you mind opening with prayer? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for always being there with us. And thank you for dying and resurrecting because Amen. that means we have salvation. And we have a better future that you have prepared for us. Thank you for everything. And Help us learn about what you have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and read just the memory verse. And it's uh, the, the Bible it's coming from. I'm not sure what version that is. It's NCV, and I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what version that is, so I'll just go ahead and read it. <laughs> it's, when I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And that can also be translated as Alpha and Omega, for those of you that uh, are reading from the King James. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and the place of the dead. So, right here in the very beginning, Israel, it says, Central to the Christian faith is the resurrection of of Jesus. And then it gives, of course, the verse from 1 Corinthians. Um, I know we'll, well, I, we'll get into it a little bit later, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is the idea that Christ's death paid the price, right? You know, yes. because, because uh, sin um, leads to death. And so Christ's death paid that price. Uh, and so then, then the important, uh, or the, the question, I guess, that sometimes comes to mind for me is, why is the resurrection part so important if Christ's death is what paid the price? That covered sin. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, it showed what Satan's kingdom leads to. It leads ultimately to the death of, of the Creator. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think that's a question that they, that they cover later on, so I don't want to jump too far ahead, but in my mind, that's right there. You know, why is his resurrection so important if it was his death that paid the price for sin? So, um, and I think that's what the lesson addresses a little further on. Was there anything there in Saturday that you wanted to point out to specifically before we no, it's, jump into Sunday? Well, no, because it's pretty much telling us an overall of the whole lesson. I think mm -hmm. if we kind of talk about it, it's just going to ruin the other days. <laughs> okay. In other words, we're you know, sharing a little too much. Yeah. Right then. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So Sundays is called a sealed tomb. And I guess uh, as I, I read over this a little bit earlier, and it was kind of funny. Uh, you know, we spoke about this a, a few minutes ago, but uh, the idea... And maybe I'm jumping ahead, but I think I, I get the sense that in this discussion, we're going to be jumping all over the place. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, I guess it was the chief priests and the Pharisees who requested a, a sealed tomb, right? Mm -hmm. And what was their reasoning for that? Just like, like why did they want that guarded? They just wanted to make sure nobody touched the tomb and pretend that something happened to the body or... ah, okay okay all right so no. so that was it yeah they just they, they wanted to make sure no one um tell sad stories lies or lies we could call them okay all about right jesus because they remembered that jesus had predicted that he would rise again and uh, i guess they wanted to make sure his disciples weren't going to you know make that happen by stealing his body okay all right and I thought that was especially funny 
considering and and maybe um <clears throat> Well, I, you know, it's, as, as the very end of that on, on Sunday says, uh, also, they put a guard around the tomb in case of what? That the disciples, like you said, might steal the body and then claim that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead? When the people would ask, well, where's the risen Jesus? They could say, well, just take our word for it. Just believe us because we say so. Um, and it's uh, it's interesting, that last statement, you, if you're following along, you'll know that the final the last part of each day, they have a question. They said, if nothing else, their actions, meaning the the chief priests and, and the Pharisees, their actions revealed just how afraid the chief priests were of Jesus, even after he died. And it says, perhaps deep down, they did fear that he just might be resurrected after all. I, I do believe that because they had personally witnessed Jesus, maybe not personally, but they saw the fruit of him raising other people back to life. I mean, right? There was Lazarus. Um, mm, huh? Yeah, there was quite... There, there's a few others. Few others. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, I don't remember them. I, I don't remember <laughs> where they are in Scripture. Well, but the little girl. The little girl. The little girl. There was the widow's son out mm -hmm. of the city of Nain. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Lazarus. I, I'm not sure if there was... I'm not sure if there was one other, but I know there was. There's, there's a few. Three. There, there's also, I think, a verse in the Bible that says he did a lot more that we uh, can't even. That's not recorded. Yeah, right? it's not recorded okay. cause, yep. so I'm pretty sure he did a, a, a quite a few. <laughs> that makes sense, and so and so they knew that he had the power to do that. So sure, why wouldn't they be afraid that if he could raise others, maybe he can also raise himself too. And, and I think they were, they were not afraid of him raising, like go, coming back to earth or alive. Mm -hmm. It was more that they were afraid that when he resurrected, that he was going to take over. And mm, it was still the idea that they would lose power. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I could, I'd totally buy that. Uh, Cause that's what they were worried about yeah. the whole time. Right. Mm -hmm. They and didn't want to give up their power. Didn't want to give up their authority. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And of course, Mondays is, uh, he's risen. The title, he is risen. Well, going back a little oh. bit on, sorry, on Sunday, sure. I, uh, the, the quote, the, the beginning of how the lesson starts, it's interesting how whenever it, it tells you that whenever Jesus died, well, he was by himself, kind mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Everybody had left him. His friends, Judah had betrayed him. Peter had denied him three times, and and even Satan was laughing because he thought he was gonna win. Which is a little bit other things that Sunday lesson talks about, <clears throat> which I found I found interesting. And then all the priests planning for the tomb and protecting him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. I wondered about that when I read that. You bring up a good point. Um, Jesus died on the cross not because he couldn't get down, right? I mean, any time he could have just said, you know what, I'm not doing this. But he submitted himself to God's will and did it and willingly stayed on the cross until he was dead. And I've always, I guess I've always kind of thought that, well, maybe not always, but I don't remember when my thinking on this changed. When Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, right? He said, it's finished, and then he died. Gave up his breath and died. Surely that moment, and I know it doesn't reflect his resurrection, but that moment must have been um, a powerful moment in the universe because it showed the entire universe that Satan's arguments were false, that they don't lead to anything good, that it actually it led to the death of the creator. So I almost get the sense then that maybe while Satan thought he triumphed in some way um, because Jesus was dead and like, yeah, okay, I can rule this earth. You know, however that sinking may have thought. Um, he must have realized that he'd lost the battle on a universe scale because God showed that love was more powerful than his argument. Like he willingly gave his own life for his creation. So he showed that love wins. Doesn't matter what, love mm -hmm. wins. Now Satan may have figured that he won the earth, 
but he didn't win on a universal scale. Yeah. Well, I also what do you think? I, I was also thinking <clears throat> when you were saying that I think it was also that Satan felt like he won because he wasn't he wasn't sure about the resurrection, and even Jesus was scared of of yeah. not resurrecting. Yeah. So if he wouldn't resurrect, it was still a win for Satan, you know. But just on an earthly scale, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I get to keep yeah. this earth. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus is dead. The Son of God is dead. And I get to keep this earth. And and I guess for <clears> him, <throat> it was also the, the part of him ruling eternally this earth. On this earth. I but, guess. But now, because, he doesn't have eternal life, though. Well, yeah. Right? Like, say, like he's... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I don't know how long an angel can live... But Satan doesn't have access to eternal life. Uh, you know, only only God can provide that. And only God has that in and of himself. So God provides eternal life to all of his other creations. But the only being that has eternal life in and of itself is, is God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Um, so whatever the lifespan of an angel is, it must be long. And Satan must... Or maybe, I don't know, because you know how Satan was able to go to heaven before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God dying. Right. I don't know if they had like, I don't know, I'm just, it's just a theory. Don't sure, you? sure. But it, maybe it had a, an agreement that if God wouldn't win, he was going to rule eternally this earth. I don't know. It's, hmm. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. Because he seemed so happy that he, he was winning there had to be a point of him being happy. I don't know. So, you've heard the saying, misery loves company, right? Yeah. And Satan must know that... I don't know. That's that's a really good question. I, I, <laughs> I get the sense that Satan must know he's not going to live forever. Well, yeah, he knows now exactly. And, even and even he, then, yeah. he must know that he's he wasn't going to live forever... Yeah, because, I'm pretty sure be, because sin in the back death. of his head, he, he right. kind of knew he just didn't want... It's like us uh, as as humans. When we lie to we, ourselves. Or, or Trick we don't want to die. Yeah. So we don't... We don't think about it. Yeah, we don't think about it. We don't, we don't want to talk about it. Yeah, we don't say anything. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe that was for Satan. Well, he's, he's the father yeah. of, of deceivers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, okay. All right. That I makes sense. Know. Makes sense. Um, just if I ignore it. It will go away type mm -hmm. type thing. Okay. All right. Um, you know, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think I'm, I'm going to love to ask Jesus about that. <laughs> did, did Satan really think he'd won when Jesus died? Um, <clears throat> or did he recognize that as his, you know, he thought he won right up until he died and he realized he lost. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um. Was there, oh, okay, okay, <clears throat> okay, and then we finished that, so on to, on to Monday then, yeah. all right, he's risen, um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, again, there's that idea that, you know, Satan thought he'd won when they laid uh, Jesus' body in the tomb, and it really makes me think, how in the world could Satan think that the God of the universe, the creator, who represents life all by himself, couldn't come back to life. You know, how did, did he just lie to himself or did he just ignore it and think, well, it's just, it puzzles me, man. It really puzzles me how he could think that he won. You know, it's, uh, I just don't understand. Well, like you said, he deceives, so yeah. he was doing the same to himself. To himself, maybe so. But man, he's I, he's good at it, I guess. I guess. And humans, yeah, as humans, you know, we have the ability to self-deceive ourselves, mm -hmm. right? I mean, very easy. We we call it justification, self-justification. Um, oh, my apologies. I forgot to turn my sound off. There we go. <clears throat> um. Now, at the very end, we were talking about this, too. I want to go ahead and read a little bit. It says, um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Matthew 28, 11 through 15, 
reveals the futile and foolish efforts of the leaders to continue fighting against Jesus. The Roman guard told the leaders all the things that had happened. And that's from Matthew 28, 11. So uh, if that's the Roman guard. That's the guys who, you you know, if they if they fall asleep on post, they're going to get killed, right? You know, they, they, they have to be there. They have to be on guard. They told the leaders, the Jewish leaders, all the things that had happened. So implicit in this is the idea that the guards saw the resurrection. So you mentioned a little bit ago, uh, Israel, before we started the video, and I think many of our of our listeners, you might be familiar with this. What were you saying about all the pictures that you've ever seen about uh, the oh, resurrection yeah, that, and the Roman guards? Yeah, that it was interesting that we we've always seen the Romans like sleeping or just. Right. I don't know, just with their eyes closed or not being able to see what ha happened. Right. Like totally unaware. Yeah, unaware, you know? yeah. I think the Bible says in, in some, I don't remember which translation that says it, that they fell down as dead men. Mm -hmm. And so we get that idea that, well, they just passed out or, you know, they were knocked out. But if they told the guards, according to Matthew 28, mm -hmm. they told the leaders all the things that had happened, they saw. That means they saw. So that means... Uh, pagan Romans who worshipped false gods got to see a real God come out of the grave. Um, that had to be pretty spectacular. That had they, to have changed their lives. They also saw angels. Yeah. Which is really interesting. It's like shining like lightning, you know, coming out of heaven. So that had to have changed their lives, you know. You get the sense that maybe those same soldiers, maybe they eventually at told least, their grandkids. At least one, <laughs> or, or at least one actually became a Christian. Hmm. Just like uh, the one that saw him on the cross, I don't know. Who said? Uh, who said? You know, this this must be the Son of God. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think it's easily believable that that must have changed at least one of their lives forever. Being able to witness something like that—that's pretty spectacular. Um, so they saw this. They told the leaders. An angel came down from heaven, moved the stone, sat on it, and then the guards fainted. I don't think so. The next thing that they knew, the tomb was empty. You know, if they had to have shared this, because if, while well, the Romans, you know, if they just fainted, uh, maybe the disciples came and stole the body, you know. Um, so the angel coming down from heaven, the men fainting from fear, the tomb being empty would have been scary enough to the religious leaders, you know, like, now what do we do? Uh, and then, but listen to this, and I think this is what kind of gives it away. They, because initially they wanted a guard, like you said, they wanted a guard there to make sure the disciples couldn't steal the body mm -hmm. and then tell everyone, oh, Jesus rose from the dead. And now this, um, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money to keep these men quiet. And they, they had the men spread the lie that they fell asleep and the disciples must have stolen the body. You know, which one was it? <laughs> I mean, was it, uh, did they want the, you know, did they not want the, the story being told that they must have known? When the soldiers told them that story, they must have known the truth of it and figured that the disciples stealing the body was the lesser, in their minds, the lesser of the two evils. Yeah. Because they couldn't let people know that Jesus It would have been, it would have been better for them, for people to think that the disciples told it that Jesus was resurrected. Right. Right, because like you said, that would undermine their authority. Mm -hmm. If if he resurrected, then he was really more powerful than they. Hmm. <clears throat> I I also like uh, how uh, not only Jesus resurrected, but other other people resurrected. Yeah, was which that, is that in Mondays? I I don't know. But because. You know, that's something, that's a, that's a text. Oh, it's Matthew. Okay, it's right in the beginning of Tuesdays. Oh, that's okay. a text that we'll not a lot of people it. talk about. Yeah. Right. I mean, as our listeners, you may not even be aware because it's not often mentioned in conjunction with Jesus' resurrection. You know, it's usually the soldiers, it's Mary, it's the empty tomb, the angel, the folded grave clothes. It's all of these other things. But would, would you read that for us from... Oh, it's Tuesday, right? Yeah, I'll Tuesday ask. is the very beginning. In the beginning. Then be here. It's the first verse, right? The mm -hmm. Matthew, Matthew 27. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
and the earth quake, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to men. Wow. There's a lot happening right there. Um, for one thing, I want to I wanna talk for a minute about the veil of the temple. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we tend to think of the curtain... You know, they're talking about the that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, right? Mm -hmm. And as a as a kid or as a as a young man, I used to think that that was kind of like a curtain, like you might have in your house. You know, that the heavyweight curtains that block out mm -hmm. the light. And I didn't realize the extent uh, of the of this veil. It was it was much less like a curtain and much more like a cloth wall. It was a very thick. Curtain. In fact, it could not be torn by human hands. It was much too thick. It was many layers of material put together and stitched and sewn. So it was a very heavy, it was literally like a, a soft sided wall that would have separated that. So it had to have been an angel who ran, you know, just ran out there and tore it. No person could have done that. It was much thicker than a person could do. And then it was from the top to from bottom. From the top to the bottom. Yeah, and so it, it couldn't have... Yeah. Been. And then, it, and if a human also would have done it, there, because if the human saw the holy part, they would die. Right. So there would right. have been a body dead. Right. So. <laughs> and people say, well, maybe it was the earthquake, right? Maybe the earthquake caused it, but the rest of the temple was undamaged. So the earthquake didn't damage the temple, but somehow tore the curtain. So definitely that. And then the importance, why, why the curtain torn? And the, the, the important part there, and I think it's, it's really important to talk about this, is that uh, Jesus' death and resurrection signified direct access to God. Before, they used to have to use a priest to mediate between them and God. You know, the priest, once a year, right, you mm -hmm. could, could go into the most holy place. But now, there was no distinction between the most holy and the holy People have direct access to God because of Jesus' death and resurrection. We can go directly to God. He is our mediator at this point. That's powerful. We no longer have to go to a priest or to anyone who stands between us and God. Uh, the temple, I mean, the veil being torn represented that it's just us and God now. There is no mediator, and I think that's, that's phenomenal. It's, yeah. it's good news. Um, <clears throat> So, but the other part, <laughs> the other part, uh, the people being raised, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was, it was just uh, how all those people being raised, yeah. well, that also took out power from the priests telling those lies. Yeah. Hey, so many people that they knew and they're like, hey, you were dead. Why are you here? <laughs> yep. It's, and, and I wonder too, mm -hmm. you know, the Bible doesn't, doesn't necessarily talk about um, who these people were. But was it just recent people or was it people dating all the way back to how long, you know, were there, were there giants from before the flood that were raised from the dead? Were there people who, um, you know, had been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years that were raised from the dead? Um, maybe famous prophets, maybe it wasn't even uh, loved ones, you know, maybe it was famous people. Uh, and they go walk around the city. Yeah, yeah, the priest couldn't say anything because now there's this evidence right there in front mm -hmm. of them. And there was also evidence that they were dead. So. Yeah, <laughs> yes. and here they are. You know, now again, the Bible doesn't give a lot of details about yeah, it this. Doesn't say who. And right, doesn't. Say, I would love to know that who. Uh, what did they look like? In you like, know, who were they? And like, why did he choose those people? Yeah. Like, it's why these and not these. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh -huh. so interesting. Uh -huh. Like, uh, why do they have to wait to the second coming and mm -hmm. not, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. I guess God knows why. <laughs> um, and it does, it does say many. Yeah. So really, we honestly, we have no idea how many. But it does say they went into Jerusalem and they appeared to many people. Um, so there is that. There is that. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, what else on there? Let's see. Hmm. I don't know. You want to go ahead and move into yeah, Wednesdays? Wednesday. Okay. All right. So Wednesdays is the witnesses. Uh, and again, this goes back to what you're talking about 
with um, with the priests, you know, trying to spread this lie. And I think God caused multiple things to happen that would prevent the priests from really spreading this lie. Uh, the veil of the temple, the many people who were raised from the dead, you know, going and appearing to many. But not just that. Um, two angels sat at the empty tomb. They told Mary and other women that Jesus had risen from the dead. And then, of course, there's... I think we need to take a little bit of a rabbit trail, and it's not uh, it's not necessarily talked about here, but when Jesus appears to Mary, right at the tomb, and uh, she she's um, she's torn up with grief. You know, can you imagine? She followed this man for th- roughly three years of her life, believing him to be the Messiah, and all of a sudden he's dead. And now she goes to the tomb, and the tomb's empty. So who stole his body? And so she's just torn up. She's totally torn up. She turns around, imagine maybe she's crying, uh, grieving, and someone calls her name, and she thinks it's the gardener. I love this story. I love it. It's, it's phenomenal. And, and she says, you know, if you've taken his body, just tell me where it is. Tell me where you've, what you've done with his body. And he calls her, her name again. He says, Mary. And finally, she realizes, like, oh, this is Jesus. And she falls down to worship him, and he says something that's really important and it strikes at the heart of what happens when we die, right? Even for Jesus, what happens when we die? He says, don't touch me yet. I have not ascended to my father. So where was he? Well, he was in the grave. And I mean, he was, he was dead, you know, but he was in the grave. He didn't go anywhere. His, his spirit didn't, take off and go to heaven or and then come back down. He just says, I have not yet ascended to my father. But he's alive. He was in this grave and now he's not. But I think that really strikes at the heart of when people say, well, our, our soul goes back to, it doesn't. The soul, the definition of a soul, according to Genesis in the King James Version, is uh, dirt and the breath or the spirit of life, mm-hmm. the breath of life. And then it says, man became a living soul. So when we give away our, our breath for the last time, like Jesus did on the cross, you know, he, he gave his breath back to God, his spirit back to God. It's the same word. Um, he, was, he was dead. That was it. The, it ceases to become a living soul anymore. It has to be those two things. And just him making that statement to Mary, I think is very powerful. So it also goes back to that idea when he told the thief on the cross. Um, you know, in many Bible translations... The oh, comma. I will see you. Yeah, yeah. So if we read it according to the way what Jesus was saying um, to Mary, he said, I haven't gone up to heaven yet. But he told the thief, you will be with me in paradise. Mm. So where did the thief go <laughs> if Jesus didn't go to heaven? Um, and Jesus promised him, you will be with me in paradise. So sometimes it's just a matter of the English language and we move that comma around, and it causes two very different meanings. When Jesus said, today I tell you the truth, you will be with me in paradise. Or, sometimes it's read, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. But Jesus didn't go to paradise. Mm-hmm. And he clearly said that to Mary, I'm, I haven't gone up yet. So I think it's, uh, it's important it's important to put different parts of the Bible together and let the Bible interpret itself and not just assume that um, what we've always been taught is the truth. Yeah. Or not base our, self, our, our ba- just not base our belief in just one uh, verse. Yeah, right, right. Um, if we just base our beliefs in, in just single verses here and we pick and choose, well, we can believe almost anything we want. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so it's very important to take the Bible as a whole and let it interpret itself. Yeah, I'm, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, so, so in this, uh, I know, I noticed it says, uh, the second paragraph there, it says during the 40 days between his resurrection and the time he went back up that he was seen by over 500 mm-hmm. believers at once. It says brethren, but generally that's assumed to mean men and women who followed him, uh, his, his followers, but over 500 people, that's enough people, you know, in Jewish law stated that the witness, uh, the testimony of two witnesses made something true. Mm. And God's, God's, you know, just going to 
throw the two witnesses right out the window and say, how about 500, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, and how about some people being raised back from the dead and going into the city and talking? How about Roman soldiers, pagans, seeing the Son of God resurrected? How about all of that? And I'm pretty sure since God was like in a tomb, mm -hmm. there was a couple more around there. Sure. So that means the soldiers not only saw Jesus, but probably a couple other they saw extra other there. people coming out of the tombs. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine how freaky? <laughs> I mean, but you know, and and sometimes people think you know, like uh, Dawn of the Living Dead or whatever, you know, like <laughs> out of the tomb. It wasn't like that at all. It was a perfect body person coming out yeah. of a tomb. Maybe uh, someone described it to me once. The resurrection. Of course, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but. Described it to me like like popcorn, like you know, just the flying and this body coming out, you know, but not like a zombie, but like a a perfect perfect body, yeah. Um, certainly not just clawing their way out of the out of the dirt at all, <laughs> not at all. Uh, I don't think God does things like that. He does things in a big way. Clearly, you know, mm. Jesus appearing to five hundred people. Um, I also I also hmm. like how the lesson talks about uh, What's that? not only just when Jesus was there, but also when he goes into heaven and Paul sees him in the light, right? Which brings more of his resurrection, even though after he goes back in mm -hmm. to heaven. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> um, and I do like this just because it speaks to the humanity. So. So when Jesus took on human form, and we're told elsewhere in, in Scripture that he's going to retain the scars, yeah. right? Like he, I mean, he was back from the dead, and he told Thomas, hey, put your fingers in, in my scars and touch, touch my, put your hand in my wound on the side. That was his resurrected body, and yet he still had the scars. So, so um, he still retains humanity, even though he's, he's God mm -hmm. as well. And so I really like this. It says... Uh, it's in, it's in John 21. It says, Jesus joined some disciples at the shore oh, yeah. of the Sea of Galilee and had breakfast with them. And the breakfast was fish cooked over a fire. Um, how much more human is that than meeting with the disciples who are fishermen in the morning, cooking them breakfast and waiting for them to come ashore and having a talk with them? That's that's really cool in, in my mind. It says that God, even though he's outside of our realm and bigger than we can comprehend, he still exists inside of our realm as well. And, and he knows how he knows how to talk to us. He speaks our language. He cooks breakfast for us and has it ready for his disciples. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And then, of course, Paul seeing him after he's resurrected, after he's perfect in heaven. Yeah, and I like how with Thomas, mm. like even though he doesn't believe, he's like, okay, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll show you I'm alive. Yeah. It's like God, yeah. even in our disbelief, he still makes sure and tries the most for us to believe. I like how he doesn't give up on us. Right, and he did, and he does it patiently. Yeah. He's like, Thomas, you idiot. <laughs> you didn't do that at all. It's like, okay, well... Feel the scars. I'm not just a spirit. You know, put your hand here. You can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and his, his statement there at the end, you, since you brought it up, he says, don't be unbelieving. Be believing. You know, and then he says and then this, because this speaks to us. This last part, uh, when Thomas, Thomas realized, oh, okay, this is real. You're real. And he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus added, Thomas, because you've seen, you've believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Yeah. And that's, that's all of us. That's all of us. And Jesus, you know, when Jesus says, blessed are those, uh, man, that's a blessing straight from his lips who haven't seen and yet believe. And I believe, you know, have you ever encountered someone in Israel and been talking to them? And have you ever asked someone the question, uh, are you a believer? Um, and they've answered in the affirmative. No, no. No. Okay. It's only happened a couple of times for me. I've been talking to someone, and something they said made me want to ask that, and and so I did. I said, "Are you a believer?" And they said, "Yes, I am a believer," and it felt almost like um, belonging to a secret club or something. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds silly to say that, but 
you know, to, to ask in such a way, are you a believer? And they knew instantly what I was talking about. A believer in what? No, they didn't have to ask. I said, yeah, I'm a believer. I thought, wow. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a neat feeling. <clears throat> um, let's go, before we hit Thursday, mm-hmm. that last sentence in Wednesdays, blessed are those who have not yet seen, who have not seen and yet have believed. Uh, even if you've not seen for yourself the resurrected Christ, what other reasons do you have for your faith in Jesus? Um, if you were to just give, I know probably have many, but what's, what's, what's one reason you have faith that Jesus is real, that he's alive, that he lives? Just the way he's worked in my life mm. and things that I've been through. Mm. And I know there's no way human possible. Yeah. Uh, it just, can't be explained yeah. by human means. Yeah. Uh, 100%. I would say the same thing. Um, I have seen the evidence in my life, and no one's going to convince me that there's a human explanation for it. And just just praying, God, I need this, or can you make this happen? And mm-hmm. it just happens. Yeah. 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 I know some people will say, well, if you just <clears throat> ask the universe for it, the universe will provide. And I thought, huh, the universe... This thing that happened by accident, that they say evolution says, oh, it just happened by accident. But this accident will provide something if you ask for it? Come on. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. Either the universe is an intelligent, you know, design, some some bigger power than ourselves, or it happened by accident. And, and they know in the back of their it, head, yeah, the, if you're asking the universe, yeah. you're really asking God. You're asking a bigger power, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something that exists. You're not asking an accident. Yeah. To provide something, yeah. Okay, <laughs> on to Thursday. <clears throat> the first fruits of those who have died. Hmm. So it says that Paul refers to Christ with that statement: "The first fruits of those who have died." Um, it's interesting because it talks about the first fruits. It uh, it says it indicated that the harvest was not only starting. In other words, like. Um, something that we do every year, or we try to every year, we have friends with pear trees, right? Some, mm-hmm. uh, some of the yards that we mow and others just friends who have pear trees on their property. Most people don't pick the pears. On, you know, they just they fall and they rot. Mm-hmm. So we ask them sometimes, hey, do you mind if we come pick the, the pears when they're ripe? And they say, yeah, come on, get whatever you want. And uh, we go and we check every once in a while, and the first pears to ripen, that would be the first fruits. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever's ripening uh, first, and so, and so, yeah, the harvest is starting at that point, but it also reveals, because this year was particularly rough for pears, almost everyone that we go and pick oh, from... The water, especially. Yeah, yeah, it was so dry and hot. And then we couldn't use our water to help. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And so most of the pears were small. They were yellow. The quality of the harvest would have been very poor. So I think it's interesting that Paul uses that, the first fruits, that the Jewish people would have recognized what that meant, first fruits of the harvest, wasn't just that the harvest was starting, but also the quality of the harvest. And the quality of the harvest was the Son of God coming back to life. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty high quality harvest. You know? So it's no wonder that he could call it the first fruits. Uh, and the Jews would have recognized what he was talking about. And when I read this, is the first, thing, first What's that? time I had that I've known this. Like mm. I just learned about it. So. Okay. But All it right. was really interesting. And I like how uh, how he compares the fruit, and he's saying since the first uh, fruit is really good quality, he's also calling us that we're really good quality, right? Which is really good. That is and, really good, and really interesting also for those people also that think, oh no, I'm just a human. I'm a yes, nobody. yes. It's like no, your quality. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. what is he's telling us. That is incredible because way too often you hear people really, I mean, I do it myself. I come down on myself sometimes. I'm really down on myself. And you hear people say that, oh, I'm not good enough to, you know, go to church or I'm not good enough to do this or good enough to do that when referencing religion. Mm -hmm. But what you just said, it it does away with all of that. If Paul's calling Jesus the first fruits, high quality, and we're the rest of the harvest, high quality too. And Jesus sees us like that. Man, um, you know, whenever I do this with, with David, 
he always, uh, he, it's kind of like, I wouldn't call it beating a dead horse, but we bring up that, that topic of hope, of hope every time. I mean, hope is, is, it's woven all throughout scripture. The message of hope comes through. And this is another way, you know, when, when, when you brought that up just now about the first fruits being quality and we're the rest of the harvest, that's hopeful to me. Mm -hmm. That's so much hope. Um, because it's easy for me to see myself and see the things I do, the choices I make, the words I use sometimes, and think there's no hope. But but if Jesus sees hope in me, and he's God, well, he's seeing something that I'm not seeing, but I'm going to have faith in that. You know, That's a hopeful message. <clears throat> um, well, at the end, of, hmm. well, not in the end, but in the middle, I like how, well, uh, well, I don't know if he decided it or whatever, but he's still going to have those marks forever, eternally, which is really interesting because I don't know, I don't remember or I don't know if I just uh, gave that conclusion to myself or something, but uh, God can, he, Jesus could have easily just mm -hmm. take like all he was those marks away. Mm -hmm. Yep, brand new body. But he he has decided to just leave them there, yeah. which is really awesome and interesting. I uh, I know there's, there. I think we'll be studying that for a long time to come in heaven, you know. But it is interesting, and to me, it speaks of it, uh, never forgetting what sin caused, you know, sin. So so that it should it mm -hmm. never come up again. It doesn't it doesn't need to because. There's the marks on the on on God's on God's hands on His side of what sin led to, so that no one will ever forget what it leads to. Um, and that's not saying that we have to that He forces us to remember the anguish and and the mental pain of sin. But also we're going to remember, you know. It's not just He wipes our memories clean and it's like a, a reboot, you know, like a computer mm -hmm. reboot and everything. Because otherwise, what's the purpose of the scars? Yeah. You know, so that he, so that we can remember what happens. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that's, it's pretty incredible that he, I guess, will keep those forever. And yeah. those scars will never go away. <clears throat> um, that finishes us all the way to Thursday. That's, I think we've, this might be record time <laughs> <laughs> that we've gone through this. Um. You know, I wanted to read... Oh, there it was. I wanted to read something. <clears throat> it was uh, it was further on down in Friday. Oh. And uh, it said, at first... the re And we talked about this for a moment. At first, the religious leaders wanted guards at the tomb to keep the disciples from stealing the body of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Later, they paid the guards to say that the disciples did steal the body. How does this account help to reveal the reality of Christ's empty tomb? And why is that empty tomb so important to us as Christians? So at the very beginning, my question was, Christ's death paid the price for sins. So why is the resurrection so important? And I, I think you, you hinted at it. Um, I mean, what, why is it so important to you? Why is the resurrection so important to you? Well, first, it also, well, I think it also shows that if we die, we are going to resurrect. Right. So that means... His promise of taking us to heaven and all that, he's going to keep it. He'll fulfill it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to die, right? I mean, yeah. okay, there's, you know, there's those outliers, <laughs> like sometimes people are depressed. Sometimes they feel like, you know, I can't go on. I, I want to take my life. I get that. I understand that there's those. But by and large, humanity doesn't want to die. Yeah. No one says, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I love doing that. Yeah, and also uh, in general, it's always playing and trying to give us more years because mm -hmm. they don't want to yeah, yeah. You know, extend our life or do something uh, I mean that was one of the first lies that Satan told ah you're not going to die uh, because that's an attractive thing oh I won't die well Jesus says it but for real you know <laughs> yeah, you may die but you will be resurrected and that empty tomb um, well it just it speaks to me if he can resurrect himself and he is God, certainly he can resurrect me as well. Mm. Um, that's, 
you know, a, a term uh, that's that's easy. It's a piece of cake for him. Uh, it also, like we talk about, um, what Satan just mm. just him re not only dying but also resurrecting confirms that Satan lost. Yeah, yeah. So that answers the question once and for all, mm -hmm. because Satan says God's God's way doesn't work. Uh, he's a tyrant. He wants to force you to do this and this and that, and you can't be good enough for him. And God says, no, 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 that's not the way it works. I will pay the price for you. I will resurrect myself, and I will resurrect you because of my price that I paid for you. And so Satan has no more power. He can lie all he wants, but there's no, there's no authority to his lie. There's no, no power to it. Um, yeah. Wow. All right. We can sometimes fall into Satan's trap also, but because Jesus died for our sins, we still have forgiveness and and we're still going to have eternity. Yeah. So, like, when you say the trap, you mean like the trap of believing that, that, we're, I mean, that we can't be good it, enough? Or? Of sin, of sin, like, mm. I guess. Like, we can fall into sin, but mm. because Jesus died for our sins, we still... We're still saved. So, yeah. <laughs> and that's a message of hope. Yeah. Um, because it's very easy to go down that road. I mean, it's, it's easy to sin, mm -hmm. right? It's just, it's easy. And, and many times, um, it's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, if, if, if sin was horrible every single time, no one would do it. But it's not. Um, and so it's easy to f go down that road and to fall. And, and to really, um, yeah, like you said, well, I guess, yeah, believe Satan's lie that I will never be good enough. And I think the most powerful message of hope is God says you don't have to. You don't have to be good enough. I was good enough for you. And, and I'm, I'm not just dead. I'm alive again. You know, I was good enough for you. I paid the price. And I want you to be with me. And man, that's, I don't know of any better message. You know, we can talk all day long about church doctrine or religious rules, but but that doesn't save anyone. What saves someone is the faith when God says that statement, I was good enough for you, and I will resurrect you. Man. I don't know. I, I figure we should close yeah. with that because that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best message of hope that, that, uh, that there is. Uh, I guess I'll close with prayer. All right. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this message that you have left us with on this, uh, this lesson study. Lord, please plant that deep into our hearts. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight as Israel and I studied and discussed together. And thank you for joining those who will, who, um, will watch this video and will maybe dive a little deeper into scripture because of this and will study for themselves. Please plant this message deep in all of our hearts and minds that we don't have to be good enough. In fact, we can't be good enough. It's true. We will never be good enough for you. And we don't have to be because you were good enough for us. So Lord, thank you for this message of salvation. Thank you for your death and your resurrection and your promise that we will be with you forever one day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, may God bless you. Until next time.